Our speaker today is Mr. Charles Dolan. Uh, Mr. Dolan is a graduate of the College of the Holy Cross. He worked uh, as a specialist at the New York Stock Exchange for over 25 years, and he managed one of the most successful specialist firms on the trading floor. Um, Mr. Dolan and Mr. Pastina recently launched a company, a consulting company, uh, and that is called Global Markets Advisory Group two years ago, signing up America's best technology and finance firms. So today we're going to learn what it takes to be a consultant and how to start your own consultant firm. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Appreciate it. Thanks for having us back. So when we were talking uh, last week, um, we said we should start with the basics, and uh, the basics really go right to what is a consultant. So uh, I consulted the source, w Wikipedia, and, uh, and I thought I'd just share some, a couple little factoids with you about uh, consulting. So uh, the definition of a consultant is a professional who provides expert advice in a particular area, and it could be any number of different areas. It could be in finance, could be in health, could be in security. Uh, but it's somebody who has some professional standing that uh, they can impart to others for a fee. Uh, the other, I found some other interesting things about consulting in uh, Wikipedia, uh, and I thought this was interesting because it certainly applies to Charlie and I. Uh, uh, there is no single qualification to be a consultant <laughs> other than those laid down in relation to uh, medical, psychological, or engineering personnel. So we don't fall into any of those uh, categories, just so you know. Uh, consultants may hold undergraduate degrees, graduate degrees, professional degrees, or professional designations. So uh, it's really about, you know, if you have a, a special skill or a set of knowledge that you're able to share with others uh, for a fee. Uh, the other thing that I thought was interesting is uh, I really kind of honed in on management consulting and I, I went and looked at the top 10 management consultants in the U.S., and it may be uh, global as well. Uh, McKinsey was number one in 2016, the Boston Consulting Company, uh, Bain Consulting Company, and uh, Bain, uh, I believe, is, is where uh, um, Mitt Romney uh, worked uh, for a while. Deloitte, um, Accenture, Price Waterhouse, so a couple of uh, accounting firms are big in the uh, in the accounting in the uh, consulting area. Ernst and Young, uh, Booz Allen, um, KPMG, and AT Kearney. So I, I thought it was interesting that um, that a lot of the accounting firms are really very heavily into the consulting side because it's a, a because it's a natural feeder to their accounting businesses. Uh, and there's a nice synergy that, that they've been able to develop back and forth between accounting services and the consulting side. So um, we're going to get into what it takes to be a consultant in a moment. But before we do that, let's, let's get to know uh, Charlie Dolan a little bit. And, and Charlie, maybe just, uh, just tell us a little bit about you know, where you grew up, where you went to school, and maybe your first job out of college. Yeah, sure. Um, and thank you for having me. Um, kind of fun to come back to uh, to a class kind of like this. I taught a lot also at the exchange, but um, to teachers and to people that wanted to come and find out what it was to be a market maker or a specialist, which is now called a designated market maker on the floor. But um, but I started, um, I went to Holy Cross College. Up, man, I grew up in um, Western Jersey and uh, followed a brother up to uh, Holy Cross and um, absolutely had no clue what I wanted to do when I graduated from school. Um, so I looked around a little bit and I found a distributing uh, house of Anheuser-Busch, a private distributing um, house of Anheuser-Busch on the South Shore of Boston. And I figured I knew beer, I could probably handle that. Um, you know, I just spent four years in college. So I, I went and worked for this distributing firm. and. Um, and I did that for about a year, and uh, it was interesting because when you're, you know, you're in a, at an impressionable age, and it, the the gentleman who ran that business, um, and it was a huge business. He owned five of those uh, distributorships, uh, which is I don't know what they're worth in today's market, but um, he used to he used to have a lot of different things. He was a, a big 
big old Marine, and he would stand up in front of you, and I guess, you know, he'd learn different things there, and he passed them along, and he's like, you know, when you're not sure what you want to do, do something, because you're going to learn from it, no matter what it is. So I kind of felt like that's where I was. And uh, I'm in the middle of seven kids. I, I love being around my family and kind of realized how much I missed being able to just stop by on a weekend or what have you. So um, I ended up coming back home to Jersey and went in to visit my brother, who was working on the floor of the exchange at the time. And when I walked onto the floor, it was right after the crash in 1987. Um, I, I guess I wasn't smart enough to realize that there was a crash and people were leaving Wall Street, not going to Wall Street. And, and I thought, you know what, I played rugby in college. It kind of reminded me a little bit of rugby. And I felt like, you know what, I could bang heads with these guys down here. This looks like a lot of fun. So, but at that time, firms really weren't hiring people for obvious reasons if the floor was even in those days contracting a little bit um, so I took a job as a what they call a runner and that was basically just running tickets from one spot to another um, and it wasn't that glamorous and I was thinking to myself you know why did I didn't go to four years of college to be doing this but but I said to myself I've you know you've got to work hard you've got to uh, let everybody see how hard you're working and maybe we used to call it get picked up by a firm um, and so I did that for probably about six or seven months and um, killing myself but I remember it was interesting because at that time the processes down there were still very manual and so there were a lot of these tickets that were flying around and if you were working your tail off I was soaked by 10:30 every morning because I was running around that floor so fast um, and so I eventually got picked up by a firm, and, and that's kind of how I started down there. I don't know if, you know. Well, Charlie, when you started, um, some, uh, some of the folks have been to the floor of the stock exchange, I think, who are in the audience. How many people were on the trading floor uh, back in, in the uh, late 80s? So when you think about it, there were 1,366 um, seats or brokers that potentially could be on the floor. And I would say for each one of um, for each person at that time, there were two, call it two and a half uh, people per broker. So there was close to 5,000 people that worked down on the floor. And I think that number today, uh, due to technology, the increases in technology, which really it had to go this way, it was just evolution um, like the rest of the world. I think that number's dwindled down to closer to maybe 700. So it's a very competitive uh, environment um, with a dwindling supply of, of people who are involved in that market. Um, however, you uh, went from becoming a runner uh, to becoming a specialist uh, and a DMM, designated market maker, eventually. And then um, you wound up running your own firm. Could you just walk us through how you went from the very bottom rung to the kind of top rung in, in that yeah. Uh, food chain? Yeah, it, it's funny because when, when Lou spoke to me about coming and maybe talking a little bit, um, I thought to myself, well, entrepreneurialism, you know, is that really me? Is it not me? And when I look back at it, I have to say that I, I do think that it's very apropos. I, I think that I went to a place when I finally did get picked up by a firm, we had 20 stocks. So for instance, if you traded, if you were a market maker in Nike, Nike only trades in one place on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. So if anybody was going to buy or sell that stock, they had to go to where that market maker was or designated market maker. And they would ask them for a quote and they'd say, where are the bids, where are the offers, you know, where can I buy 5,000 shares, where can I sell 2,000 shares, whatever it may be. And, um, so what happened was I got picked up by this firm and that was kind of like my first day of French class because there's a totally different language to the floor and um, and it's not like when you buy a house to me it's always funny because people say they you know you make an offer on a house you don't make an offer on a house you make a bid on a house right you go to buy the house an offer to me is the person selling the house not the person buying it so even that you know there was all this different kind of language that you had to learn so I started as a, a trading assistant and the first thing that everyone there said to me is okay you're responsible to go and get the lunch so okay so I would every day I would go downstairs and I would they would have a box that would be delivered by some place because we all ate where we stood you didn't leave for lunch ever I think in the 25 years I was there I left maybe less than 10 times to go to lunch. Um, so I stood on that floor in one spot every single day. 
But so I went downstairs and they said, you can give the guy a tip if you want to give him a tip. So I would go down and get the box and, and then I'd look at the bill and I reach into my pocket and pull like I'm living at my parents. I don't know what I was making, maybe $18,000 a year. And I, and I reach into my pocket and I pull out three bucks and I, I'm saying to myself, this is going to get expensive. You know, I'm, I, this is kind of a pain. And I go back upstairs and then finally I didn't realize you were supposed to add the tip to the bill. And, and you know, it wouldn't cost me money. The firm would be paying for it. So then I was, um, I was put in with a specialist. So in other words, you, there's those trading posts that you see on the television when you see the floor. And if you're on the outside of that trading post, you're typically a broker. And if you're on the inside, you're a trading assistant. And trading assistant's probably the, one of the toughest jobs you could ever have. I mean, when it's not going well for the guy out front, it's always your fault. I worked for a drill instructor from Paris Island for four years, and every single night that I went home, I said I was going to quit. And, and everybody said, just hang in there, hang in there. And what en ends up happening is over time, the business was basically, lack of a better way of putting it, almost beaten into you. And um, then when I turned 30, I had a couple of things happen. Uh, so I was brought out to dinner by the uh, partners who kind of schnookered me into a dinner. I didn't know they were all going to be there, and they said, you know, we're going to bring you out and make you a specialist, which was always what you were trying to shoot for. And um, and that year two was the first year I ran the marathon. So I ran through the uh, Brooklyn here, which was fun. So it was kind of a fun kind of two things that happened to me when I was 30 years old. Um, and there were lots of ups and downs. And so then I, I started my career as a trader, and, um, and I went through, you know, the next 25 years to a point where finally at the end of those 25 years uh, I was managing probably all in about 45 people we had um, close to 700 800 stocks that we were making markets in um, we would go trade in and out of about 20 million dollars of our own capital on a daily basis uh, probably close to 800 million dollars of um, dollar value in the stocks that we traded on a daily basis because back then uh, the floor traded about forty billion dollars a day, I right. think. So, so I, I, you, know, you mentioned uh, uh, making an offer on a house, and I was just involved in a uh, in a house closing with uh, lawyers and buyers and sellers, and it took about two hours to consummate a I don't know a half a million dollar deal. Could you just walk through what what a deal on the floor of the stock exchange uh, might sound like and the time frame it would take to and the uh, dollar amount that would be involved in, and and just to give people a sense of what entrepreneurism is like on the floor of the stock exchange yeah well um it was an amazing place because as lou says that that 40 billion dollars that changes hands there are no contracts there what you basically did is a broker from upstairs or you know a trader upstairs let's say it's a goldman sachs trader would send down an order back in the day to buy a hundred thousand shares of a stock and and then that trader would come in and, and if it was a liquid stock say it's a pfizer or it's a big you know s p company um they'd come in and they'd say i need an offer on on a hundred thousand shares of stock and and you, you know we would say okay you, so an offer is, I, I need to buy 100,000 shares. Where can I buy it? We say you can buy it up a dime. The broker says, I'll take them, right? So he says, I take them. I said, sold to you. We would consummate that trade by the trading assistant hitting the keystrokes to log the trade into the system, which sends it to the ticker tape. Um, that trade is consummated literally in seconds, and, and it's turned around, and the broker then just gives a report back upstairs, and it's done. And and that's done millions of times every single day down on that floor. It's even though what you see today is much more automated, the same basic processes are taking place. Um, basically, what was done, and we had to do this in my firm when we started to become more and more electronic, and it was very interesting to wa watch that transition. We as a firm had to come up with. Um, an algorithmic trading system to interject our liquidity into the marketplace. So we actually had to build those systems. So there's an entrepreneurial thing about that as well, because if you really think about it, you were creating almost a business within a business. And, um, and you could actually, we actually supplied that technology 
to the New York Stock Exchange eventually bought the um, American Stock Exchange. And the regulators came to our firm and asked whether we would supply our technology to the firms that were transitioning over to the New York. So we didn't even know it at the time, but we were entrepreneurs in the sense that we built the system that the regulators liked so much that they were asked us to supply it to the other firms. So, um, you know, in, in doing deals like that where you're exchanging millions of dollars in basically a few seconds, uh, it can be pretty stressful. And, uh, and, and you're doing that all day long. Were there times when uh, traders would break the stress a little bit and maybe uh, – <laughs> And maybe joke around a little bit. Well, any, I, I, any situations I, I'll, give you, like that? I'll give you two examples how it could be stressful and how it can be fun. Um, so we, when Martha Stewart went public, we, what happens is you meet listing requirements of an exchange. So for, for right now, like Snapchat is looking to go public, right? And the New York Stock Exchange is trying to woo them. Lou said he saw just a big banner on the on the front of the exchange says, "Welcome Snapchat." Well, they don't even have it yet, but they're trying to get it. So they want that stock to trade with them. So. Um, that firm then interviews the different DMM firms and then they choose who they want to trade the stock. So when Martha Stewart went public, she chose our firm to trade the stock. I went to the listing breakfast with her upstairs um, on the seventh floor, I believe it was. And then we went downstairs and we had our best trading assistant running that stock with my older brother. And it was, it was like in the 2001 time frame. And it was all the dot-coms were going crazy. UPS had gone public. Um, and uh, there was huge retail following in Martha Stewart for obvious reasons because every, you know, every woman around the country wanted to buy 100 shares of Martha Stewart or 10 shares or whatever. And um, so we sat in front of that opening doing, going through the IPO, which could be a whole nother class, so I won't bore you with that. But that trading assistant was sitting there and – and he made an error. And he made an error, the same error, three times over the course of five minutes. And that cost us as partners four and a half million dollars in five minutes. And it was really, really tough situation. To put that into um, perspective, a big error prior to that time within our firm was probably $20,000. That would have been a big error. So four and a half million dollars gone in five minutes it's tough and and like there were times that literally you know you didn't leave to go to the bathroom you didn't have lunch and you stood there and you traded from the day from the second that bell rang till you went home and and I, I'm the type of guy when I was younger I had a hard time falling asleep at night but I would pass out on the path train going to New Jersey in five minutes because mentally you were so shot one zero could make the difference in a day's trading but like Lou says there there are also times that you bring a little levity to the whole thing and uh, and there were there were a lot of practical jokes played back and forth on people like you know there used to be a ton of paper down there and um, and to the point where literally it was a few inches deep um, you know towards the end of the day and one of my partners, he said, when he was slow, you know, they'd order Chinese food or something, and he'd get the white rice, which is really sticky stuff, and he'd just start sprinkling it out on the floor. And these people would be walking around, stepping on the rice and then stepping on the paper, and they'd have, they couldn't get the paper off the bottom of their shoes. Another time we had a guy in the back who they have all these weight bets all the time down there. And... And the way that it works is, let's say everybody in this room decides to do a weight bet, and you each have to lose 10% of your body weight, right? Well, the people who don't make it have to pay the people who make it 100 bucks a piece. So it, it could cost you a lot of money if you didn't make the weight. So we had this one kid who came in with this giant thing, a Slim Fast, this chocolate Slim Fast, and he's like, I'm just going to throw this in here, and he starts shaking it up, and he starts drinking it, and he's like, stuff's actually pretty good. This is going to be a layup. I'm going to have no problem, right? So that night, what he didn't realize is everybody went home. One guy has to stay late to kind of close things up. And that guy took his Slim Fast, dumped it in the garbage, and filled the Slim Fast container with brownie mix, right? <laughs> so the next day, the guy comes in. It's 12 o'clock. He gets the two scoops, puts it in the milk. He shakes it up, starts drinking it. He goes, this stuff is awesome. This is going to be a layup, right? And Two weeks later, he's up three pounds, and he sit, comes in, he's sweating. He's like, I don't know what's going on, you know. And, uh, but, I mean, we'd had a t 
ton of different things that we had fun with when it was I slow. hope you let them off the hook. Eventually, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, after 25 years uh, on the floor of the stock exchange, eventually your firm was sold to uh, another firm. And um, you found yourself at a time in your life when you, you, know, you, you could do almost anything you, you wanted to do, and you decided to become a consultant. Could you just talk a little bit about how you decided to become a consultant, what led you to uh, form the Global uh, Advisory uh, group? group? Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, it, um, it's interesting how, how things happen, but through, throughout the course of the time that I was at the exchange and because of the fact that I participated, the exchange is a self-regulatory body, so we enforce the rules ourselves on the floor. And so there's a hierarchy of, um, of folks who do that. Um, the bottom rung is a, is a floor official who can make basic rulings on, on different situations that take place. Uh, you can then become a senior floor official and then a governor and then a senior governor and then, a, um, and then an executive floor governor. And so when you get to the end of that rung, there's probably, at the time, there were probably 150 um, officials, floor officials, and and then governors, there were like 16, and then there were only like five executive floor governors. So I ended up getting to a point where I was an executive floor governor appointed by the uh, CEO of the exchange. And um, you could then make more serious rulings in bank stocks and different things like that that, that needed that type of expertise to kind of, um, you know, if there was a bad trade that went on, how do you handle that? What do you do about it? So I made a lot of different, I had a lot of different relationships, not only with folks like Lou, um, but also with the regulators that are inside of the exchange. And one of those folks uh, gave me a call, and it was through LinkedIn, I think, uh, after I was off the floor. And I, and I do have to say that my career on the floor came to an end when our firm was bought, like Lou said. Um, a firm that bought us gave me a pretty significant contract to run the firm for them for the next year. More money than I had made in the previous three years combined. And three months into that, it became pretty clear to me that they weren't so interested in the rules. And I made a decision. I have three kids at home, uh, 16, 14, and 11. And every day I try to teach them that the most important thing they have is their name. And to me, I, I have to live that too. And I ended up walking away from that contract because I think that no matter what happens to you, and this goes to everybody in this room, your name means more to you than anything else. It just do the right thing and don't hurt your name. You know, I, it's funny. Somebody, because I say that all the time, somebody sent me this poem, and it just talks about that your father handed you that name, and you need to hand that name to your children, right? And it was good when he gave it to you, so it should be good when you pass it off. Um, and I believe that. So. I took, away, uh, I took a, a walk from that, which my wife wasn't so excited, but I, I figured I have to do the right thing and the right things will happen. Um, so anyway, this former regulator called me up and said, you know, you were terrific on the operational side of the exchange. I'm pretty good on the regulatory side. Maybe we should do something together. And that's how this whole dialogue started. So when we began to think about that, um, we started to um, offer services out to companies. So a lot of firms, uh, broker dealers in the, um, in the trading universe have problems that they need to address. So we said, well, you know, we live that and we like it. Why don't, and, and the trading side of the business is shrinking. The number of people that are out, that are out there as traders is shrinking be due to technology, but the regulatory side of the business is never gonna go away. So maybe it makes sense to try to dip our toes into that. And we started that way. Now, I'd be lying if I told you that I knew exactly what we were going to be and what we are going to be. Um, uh, what I have found, at least, is in trying to do this, this business morphs into things. And, and it's kind of funny. We In the office that we have out in Jersey, we get a phone call every once in a while of somebody asking if, if this is the house cleaning service. And I said to my partner, listen, the answer is yes until we figure something else out. I said, if somebody calls and asks if we can do dental work, the answer is yes. We're going to figure it out, right? So, so you're a little humble, Charlie. You know, you you spent 25 years on the floor of the stock exchange, and during that time period, you acquired um, a set of expert knowledge on the rules. Yeah. Um, you built a reputation for integrity and honesty. Uh, and through relationships that you had with people both at the exchange and at the regulators at the Securities and Exchange Commission and at FINRA, 
which allow you basically to walk into either the chairman's office or a commissioner's office uh, and be welcomed. How did you uh, parlay that into the consulting firm and what type of uh, clients um, did that bring to you? Yeah, so so the the first thing is, like I said, we started working um, with the folks at FINRA um, to help some firms that were having regu regulatory issues. And the, you can either have a review that's mandated by the regulators or you can just want an internal review done of your own processes. And so we did both of those things. So, so that knowledge over time helped there. We were then, um, not just myself, but, but Lou as well, um, we went in, there's a huge industry initiative, um, and this is if you're a techie, you would love this. After the flash crash in 2010, um, the regulators realized that they couldn't recreate the market in any specific moment in time, so they needed to create something that would ingest all of the trade data, the cancellations, the quotes, everything that happens on a daily basis in the markets so that they could go back and recreate the market um, at any specific moment in time to find out what happened. Um, think of it as like kind of a, um, the NTSB with a plane crash, right, where they cordon off the area, they find every single piece of that plane and they put it back together in, in a hangar. This is the same thing, but it's the trading data. So right now there's 60 billion data points that need to be ingested by this um, consolidated audit trail um, initiative on a daily basis and it has to be archived for five years. So we, Lou and I and, and a couple other folks in the firm um, were retained by, um, by a, a large data firm and, and a huge, um, I don't know if I can give names, but, sure. but yeah. well, we were retained by a company called SunGuard. This is Brooklyn, you could do anything here. We, we were retained by a company called SunGuard, uh, and SunGuard was going to create the front end of this system that all the firms would have to interact with, but they certainly couldn't handle the data side of it, so they were partnered with Google to, um, to, do, to host this data in the public cloud. So as a result of just being out there and, and having those relationships, we got in with these folks, and now we're in the process of potentially signing a deal to work with Google on their financial services platform to help them think about where the business is going in the future and, and how do they address it. And the other thing that you realize over a career of 25 years, and like Lou says, um, you know, trying to do the right thing day in and day out is you can make phone calls to people that could significantly influence someone's business. And you can go down and see the SEC or, um, and we know folks there and, and like Lou said, and FINRA and different spots like that. So it has been super helpful. So if you had a suggestion um, for the students about uh, becoming a consultant uh, as they build their uh, kind of entrepreneurship skills, what kind of uh, thoughts would you, would you pass on? Well, I mean, I, I think that knowledge is king, right? And, and I think that, um, that I would never look down upon an opportunity as, as something that might be below you. Like, I can just remember that, and it's hard because I witnessed this down on the floor. We used, had this one kid in particular who graduated from Georgetown, and he came and worked for us for the summer. And, you know, there was now this other guy getting the lunch who had been down on the floor for 20 years. And, the, and we said to this kid, listen, you're going to get the lunch. He's taking the summer off. And three weeks later, I noticed that the, this guy, Davey, who was the heart and soul of our firm, was getting the lunch again. And I said to him, what's going on? And he said, well, the kid says he's not getting the lunch, and I have to get it. So that didn't go over so well, right? I mean, this person said, I didn't go to Georgetown to go get the lunch. Well, you get the lunch. And you get the lunch better than anybody's gotten it in, your, in their life. And 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 listen to people right and i just think that each opportunity you got to try to figure out what you can pull from it i i look back even at that job with budweiser and i think to myself there's still things that i think about that helped me along the way when i had that job and was it the perfect job for me no but um but i think it's important to keep an open mind as to things that interest you and try to drive yourself towards those things and, uh, and I would absolutely say just never sacrifice your ethics. Um, Charlie, before we open it up to questions, because I know we have a group that uh, needs to leave by 1 o'clock, um, I just wanted to ask you who you consider to be your role model, both uh, 
you know, for your entrepreneurship uh, and for uh, your work ethic? Uh, well, like the obvious answer would be my father, obviously. Uh, well, not obvious to you folks, but my father was a trial lawyer in, in Newark, New Jersey for his entire life um, and started a firm there that was five folks. Um, I, I never forget a story like the, the real senior guy at that time, you know, with five people came to the other partners and said to them, I'm leaving. And he had all the business. Um, he had a ton of huge clients and and he said I'm leaving to go to th become a judge on a Third Circuit Court of Appeals in in um, New York or in, no in Jersey I think it was and so the other partners got together and they were like holy shit what are we gonna do now you know the the big guys leaving and someone said you know who can take over the caseload and my father raised his hand and said I'll do it I can do it and he went home to my mother and said you know, there's seven kids. There's, it's it's a complete disaster at home, and and he looks at her and says, uh, "I told them I could do it." She said, "Can you do it?" He goes, "No, I can't do it. I, but I'm gonna do it, right?" And and so he built that firm from five lawyers to 250 lawyers. And to me, there'd be nothing more fun than than to try to create something again. And I, so I looked at him and I look at the way he lived his life and certainly the uh, I was fortunate enough to work for a, a man by the name of John Lydon and John Lydon allowed me to live my life the way that I was brought up so that also instilled in me I think um, that ultimately no matter what happens as long as I've got my name I, I'll be okay and and I think that's that's super important to think about. Uh, I know it sounds just kind of it kind of sounds silly, but I think in today's day and age, you know, everything's about a quick buck or or trying to get ahead fast. And I and I think you know, dues are meant to be paid. If it's worthwhile, it's going to be difficult to do. And when those four years when I was getting my head handed to me every single day and I wanted to quit, you know, when I look back at it, it was healthy. It was it was actually tough, but it was it was worthwhile. Actually, I don't think we hear that enough in life, so that, that's uh, good stuff. Uh, be before we take questions, um, I just wanted to mention that, you know, uh, Charlie and I and another partner, uh, Kevin Trimble, uh, formed this company. It's actually a limited liability corporation. But you may find yourself um, uh, becoming a consultant only because of today's job market. Uh, you may be uh, independent yourself. Companies sometimes hire people, but they don't hire them as employees. They hire them as uh, a, an independent contractor, if you will. And that's another form of a consultant, right? So if you come out of school and perhaps you're terrific at coding or you have some IT skills or you have some other type of skill that's in high demand, you may find that um, you're your own um, your own business and you're working as a consultant or a contractor for a firm which means that you know you have to pay your own taxes they'll give you a 1099 it's a different kind of relationship than the traditional employee uh, employer relationship that uh, that has been prevalent in the past so um, being a consultant uh, might be something that's in in your future uh, as well so with that, I, I think we have about 10 minutes before 1 o'clock, and I want to make sure that you do get out of here to catch the bus, so I don't want to be uh, blamed for you not getting that bus. So let's, uh, let's open it up for a couple of questions. I know there's a lot of different types of consulting, so like, what is the most lucrative? Like, like, I know there's so many different types, but out of all, like, I know there's financial security, the, uh, a few other things. We like, could tell you it's not what we're doing. <laughs> 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 all right. Well, um, here's... To that question, it, it, there is there was an interesting. Uh, I think I have this. I kept it here. Somewhere. Oh yeah. So, um, and this isn't just consulting, but um, and these are total revenues for uh, at least four of the firms that I mentioned before. So Deloitte's total revenues were 14.7 billion. Um, and Price Waterhouse Coopers, uh, 127, uh, ENY Ernst and Young, 12.1 billion, KPMG, 10.7 billion. So, uh, if you if you're in one of those 
big four accounting firms uh, th that sounds like they, they do okay uh, yeah. however you know there there's there's all sorts of uh, consulting relationships and I think it really depends on the uh, the expertise that you have and, and what you can bill yourself out at it's one of the interesting things uh, struggles that uh, Charlie and Kevin and I have had as consultants what do we charge yeah. what are we worth uh, if we took our prior salary, divided it so that we came up with a per hour rate, is that, is that a, uh, you know, the right charge? Is it whatever the market can bear? Um, is it what other consultants in our categories charge? A very difficult question to price your own services. I don't uh, know if you yeah, I would, I would add to that uh, probably some of it is dictated by how busy you are, right? So if you've got six, seven, eight, ten things going on at the same time, and somebody calls you and says, we could really use your help with this, you feel a lot, you know, if you say, okay, well, that's going to be 800 bucks an hour, um, and if they say no, you're like, okay, bye, you know, um, but that's, that's high, don't get me wrong. Um, the other, and I would add to what Lou said as well, um, the other thing that we think about is firms don't like that open-ended I'm paying this guy hourly I don't he's not in my office I don't see the person you know I'd rather have a flat fee for a project um, so we've kind of learned how to step back and back into a number that we think is reasonable but we also try to protect ourselves by saying okay you know we will we'll work for X amount to finish this project but you know, if there's really outstanding things, or there's something within the project that, or the scope of work that you're asking us to do that's outside of it, which seems to happen a lot, you have to be very careful about that. So, so f for instance, we were hired to review recently some exchanges so that another firm could use their technology. And then the person said to Lou, well, we need to hire an operations person. Could you help us do that? Well, certainly, if we gave them a number to do the first job, Lou should get paid something in addition for vetting a an operations person to hire, right? So we call that drift of scope, kind of. And I and I would say that you have to kind of be careful about those types of things, and you have to stay focused on what you say you're going to do because your knowledge is your worth, right? So, so so to us at least, um, when if you're an independent person you are your bandwidth, right? So one of the ways that, um, that Lou and Kevin and I have thought about this firm is we certainly have some skill sets, but we don't have all skill sets. Um, so what would you rather do? What I'd like to see this firm become is we, pull, we draw in, like we've done, to now about five other folks that are all 1099. So they are their own LLC, but they fall under our umbrella and we can use their um, expertise. So it, it's one thing if maybe you're doing a, accounting work for a specific company and you're just doing that work alone. But for us, we find that um, it's it gives you more bandwidth to have a group of people around you and you seem like a more significant player. I'm pretty sure Charlie Dolan alone wouldn't have been hired by Google. but. If I'm Charlie Dolan with Lou Pasina, who was a big shot at the New York Stock Exchange, and Kevin Trimble, who is a chief compliance officer and chief operating officer, and we have someone else who's an expert in the listings department, we have someone else on corporate governance, that that group as a whole might be stronger than the individual. So I think those are kind of the considerations that I would take into. And I would add to what Charlie's saying, uh, it depends on uh, the liability circumstances of your employment. So. If, um, if you're offering advice or a product or services um, as a consultant or a contractor and you're not covered by uh, the person, the client who's employing you in some way to absolve you if anything wrong happens, then sometimes it's worth it to uh, not just be a sole proprietor but to be an LLC, a limited liability corporation, because you have some li liability protection in terms of if they wanted to sue you or not, so on a personal level. Because the, the flyer that uh, we did for uh, this event had a picture of Charlie on the trading floor with a sign. And the sign said, uh, we're still here. Could you just tell us wh what the background of that? Well, oh, they hear it. They there's this. He looks the same. It was that. That was act, that was actually on the uh, that was actually on the front page of the London Sun. Uh, and a buddy of mine from Holy Cross is walking through the airport in Heathrow, and he's like, 
He's like, dude, I walked through the airport, and it was after 9-11, and he said, and, and your mug is all over the newsstands. And I'm like, well, you know, I, I was not in on, on uh, 9-11. I had the week off. Um, and in, I know it's going to sound nuts, but in some respects, I almost wish I was on the trading floor because, as you can recall, we, we had no ability to um, communicate with uh, people that I worked with and had no idea what was going on. My brother was in on that day. And, um, and you know, it was, it was, from what I understand from Lou and other folks, um, you know, it was a pretty, obviously, a pretty brutal day for everybody. But, you know, I... At first, I just was kind of in shock, and I felt like, you know, my generation really hasn't been, hasn't been, f hasn't faced anything. When you think of, I was, I was too young for Vietnam or Korea or any of that. I was born in '63. I, I didn't know that, you know, the whole JFK thing and different things. And all of a sudden, it seemed like this was going to be our, our challenge, right? This is, this was going to change my life, and, and it's going to be something that our generation has to face. So. I, I was off that week, and, and I, the more and more I started thinking about it, I was just getting pissed. I was getting more and more ticked off every day. And, and I, you know, by the end of the week, everybody pretty much knew it was bin Laden who, who did this. And, and I just wanted to send my own message that said to them saying, you know, we're still here. You, you, can, you can sucker punch us, but we're going to be here, and we're going to ring the bell. And, you know, in all honesty, other than the birth of my kids, it was probably the most uh, proud moment of my life because, um, you know, Lou Dobbs came up to me that, that day and we lost an entire firm, basically, that had, a, had a, a meeting at Windows of the World and they had no reason to be there, zero reason to be there. They are never there. This was the one time they had a meeting there and not one of those guys got out. And that day when we went back on that following Monday, <clears throat> their wives were all on the trading floor with their badges on trying to keep their business going. And one of them was pregnant. And, you know, it was, it was rough. But so I just wanted to send in my own screw you to, to them overseas. And I had a feeling it would get picked up because where I'm standing there is right in the middle of the trading floor and there's a balcony and it was filled with photographers. And I, I wanted to put something else on there, but, but, uh, but I figured my boss would fire me if, it, if I really put what I wanted to write. But, um, but I figured that was close enough and people would get the message. So, um, yeah, that was pretty rough, you know. And not seeing that guy. There was a guy literally named Bobby Sutcliffe who was, who was from me to that podium every single day, every day. He would stand there and trade this one particular stock. And... For him not to be there was just, it was pretty rough. But, uh, you know, and I will say the exchange did, and Lou and everybody did an amazing job of getting us back to work. Um, it was kind of tough because when I would come from Jersey, obviously the path trains are down. So we'd get on a ferry, and you'd know whether we were going to have a good day or a bad day just by the wind direction because if the wind was blowing uptown, we were fine. If the wind was blowing downtown, it it was a smell like I never, ever will, will never forget it. But, um, you know, but, and these guys were not Lou, but the people in the exchange, I think were changing the air filters like every hour or something. Right. I, I don't know. It's yeah, kind of Wall Street gets pummeled uh, these days, but uh, it was one of the finer moments for the, uh, for Wall Street. I, I would agree. I